I may have the world's best job because I get days like this when I get to interview people like Joe Paquette. Joe, uh, <laughs> welcome. Great to be here, Eric. We did. We decided to do this little impromptu thing uh, because Joe is going to be at the Plein Air Convention. He hasn't been there for a long, long time. Um, Efren Gonzalez was talking about this just the other day about how he met Joe and how it changed his life, his career after watching Joe speak and watching him paint. And Joe is coming back to the Plein Air Convention. Uh, he is doing a pre-convention workshop. And I thought it would be fun, Joe, first off, just to talk a little bit about that, just to talk about a couple of things, but to, to kind of get inside your head. But first, I want to show people something. I want to show them the cover of Plein Air Magazine uh, with your painting on it. And uh, what's the story behind that painting? Uh, it was during, uh, during COVID, uh, the articles uh, the, that Bob Barr had written a uh, really well-written article, an interview, but it was about doing large paintings during COVID. Like I took that two years to do nothing but very large paintings outside. This is a 40 by 50 inch painting of a community garden, uh, and uh, which is you know not far from my home. Most of the paintings I did were were not far from home at all. Uh, but you know the 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 you know the the attempt was to try to. Uh, push myself really and see um, how far I could go. It's something I'd always wanted to do and COVID gave me the excuse to do it. So what's it, what, what's the process like to do uh, such a large painting, a location? That's a, actually, it's a good question because it's a good part of what I'll be um, talking about in the workshop that it, it's uh, the, the, the start, how you begin the painting or how I begin the painting is to me is, is of utmost importance. Uh, and that starts with a drawing, you know, a drawing that's rhythmic and hierarchical uh, and then uh, an underpainting to freeze the effect, which these are the things I'll be talking about. Uh, um, and then uh, the challenge is to hold the effect, right? I mean, the, the more unified or the more singular the effect to me, the more interesting the painting. I don't like, I'm not interested in a generic image. For me, um, uh, I put the same amount of care into a landscape as I would into a portrait. Uh, and, um, that's, and that surprises a lot of people. And so in my classes, I've always raised a very, very high bar uh, for shape and for drawing and for the idea of rhythmic connectivity. So when I'm, when I'm laying that thing out and I'm composing it, um, my hand is constantly moving around, connecting forms, and uh, trying to create a trip for the eye that's exciting, you know, because well, the eye I, likes that. And, and I think that's something that's completely, we hear that, we hear people talk about that, but I think it's it's often mid up, misunderstood, and you're going to actually show us how to do that. Yeah, I'm going to flesh all that out. As a matter of fact, I'm going to spend an immense amount of time speaking specifically about drawing. And that's something that is often uh, kind of bulldozed over in, in, in the plein air world. Uh, so what do you and, say to somebody who says, well, I can't draw, so I, but I can draw when I paint? I would say that uh, that might be uh, a, a fabulous uh, justification. <laughs> <laughs> because the thing is that, uh, you know, drawing is, is, is everything. It's not something. And, and to me, the, 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 what, the artists that are out there today that I would consider masterful are not many. Uh, in my esteem, there are a lot of good painters, but not a lot of masterful ones. But every single one of them are two things. They're very smart people, uh, and they draw exquisitely well. So the, that you, term gets thrown around pretty loosely. We're a little guilty of it ourselves. Um, you know, everybody's a master. How, how would you define someone who is a master? Well, I, I don't consider myself a master at all. I consider myself a student, uh, maybe more advanced than some, but uh, I think if you spend a lot, great deal of time outside, and uh, in the article I talk about it, all these large paintings, you spend hours standing in one spot. If you are not touched uh, or awed by the, the perfection and the beauty that exists in front of you, uh, then you're not connected. And so the, to me, the hum there's a certain amount of humility that is absolutely requisite 
to approach nature. Uh, and, and we've talked about this before, but a certain amount of uh, hubris or ego just to face a blank canvas. So there's a balance between the two. But uh, I generally don't, I, I don't find real hardcore outdoor painters generally terribly egotistical uh, because they're constantly being schooled by what's in front of them. You know, it, you can convince yourself if you spend all of your time in the studio that you are, you know, you're something special. Being outdoors all the time makes me uh, um, see my place in the, in the kind of in the cosmos. It makes me, uh, uh, I just like have this profound respect for what's in front of me. And then if I think about the great artists that have touched me, some of whom I'll talk about in this workshop, uh, Levitan being one of them, truly it was not uh, technique. We keep thinking about it's technique, it's technique, it's technique. There's a trick, there's a trick. There's no darn trick. There's no damn trick out there. The, 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 there, there are tricks, but th those are shortcuts. And, and there's no shortcut to sensitivity. Sensitivity is something either you develop or you don't. And I think a lot of the time in lieu of sensitivity, people supplement that with subject matter. And you're uh, going to be showing us how you would recommend developing sensitivity. Absolutely. Absolutely. But like I said, the biggest, one of the biggest components to sensitivity is humility to what's in front of you. Because nature can't, will not reveal herself to those who are not open. So let's talk about the topic that you just raised. And, and you said, if you're not getting outdoors, mm -hmm. there are potentially thousands of people watching this who are studio painters and, and pretty accomplished studio painters. But what is it specifically? I know you got into the, the essence of, of, you know, absorbing uh, the essence of what you see, but what is it about getting outdoors that changes you as a painter? Oh, actually, that, the closing talk that I'm going to be giving for you is, is called the living experience. And, uh, and that's exactly what I'm going to be talking about. And it, it, in, in a, just in a nutshell, what it has to do with, with is a sensory engagement, right? I mean, every, every sense that you engage uh, in an experience heightens the potential reception of that experience. So working outdoors as opposed to working in the studio, you know, I, don't let anybody tell you that it's the same thing or that it's no different. It's completely different. You know, the, the silly analogy that I use in my class all the time is when I teach, you know, I said it's the difference between your child uh, wrapping their arms around you or, or your loved one and telling you they love you and that feeling that you feel versus you know, Spock from, from Star Trek explaining the chemistry of love on your brain. They're very different things. Or it, it, it's, it, you know, the plein air equivalent would be um, your child giving you a hug and telling you they love you versus looking at a photo on top of the piano of your child. Well, that's exactly right. Uh, there is, it's, it's a fine analogy. The, the, the point being that uh, there's, there's, there's nothing that supplants Nothing in the studio can supplant the time spent with your feet on the ground where you, you're smelling it, you're tasting it, you're touching it, you know, um, you're getting rained on, you, you know, you're cold, you're hot, you know, it, you become part of it. There was a painting I did a number of years ago. Uh, I, I didn't know where our conversation was going to go. Otherwise, I would have uh, sent it. And it was a forest interior uh, from Madeline Island. A 24 by 30 inch forest interior. I spent five mornings working on one painting and then the five afternoons working on another and trying to freeze an effect, which again, this is what I'm going to be talking about. How do you hold an effect and not get lost? Anyway, I'm standing in the woods and, you know, and I, you know, consider myself somewhat sensitive uh, because I'm outside all the time. But what happened is over the days, you start to feel like, uh, like an Indian. You feel like uh, all of a sudden, I smell something that I didn't smell two days ago. I noticed that the breeze is blowing off of Lake Superior and the scent of fresh water mingling with blowing over the ferns and stuff. And, and, and all of a sudden you become enveloped in this experience. And then you, I noticed the moss under my feet and, and it just, and it was half day after day by the fifth day, I was so uh, kind of um, apart 
a part of that environment that it was profound. You know, even to me after all these years, it was like, wow, this was what a spectacular experience. You know, most of us don't stand still long enough to, to receive that kind of thing. And believe me, for a guy that I'm sure I would have been diagnosed with dyslexia and ADD and all that back, you know, when I was a kid, uh, um, I've, I've just learned to, to be still. And, you know, it's like that scene from a Vacation with Chevy Chase, right? They drive, they go to this giant hassle to drive all the way across the country to get to the Grand Canyon. They get there and they go take a picture and leave. That's it. But... Uh, but but the difference between a day out versus five days out on a particular painting, mm -hmm. you're you're able somehow, and you're going to show us how to essentially communicate the spirit of what you felt um, in that particular environment. Well, the, the truth is, Eric, you can't help uh, but transmit that spirit if you're in it long enough. If you approach nature as a visitor, that's all nature's ever going to give you. And I, you know, I have had the same experience. I was painting at the big tunnel view in Yosemite with this amazing group of painters a bunch of years ago. And the snow was swirling and these buses stopped and all these tourists poured, just disgorged. <laughs> and they came and they flowed around us like lava and they're standing right in front of us and not paying any attention right in your space. And all that all you hear is click, 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 cameras going off all over the place. And then they run to the bus and they're gone. So their whole experience of Yosemite Valley will be a, a photo on their computer. They didn't even, I mean, they didn't take the time to breathe the air. <laughs> so, you know, it's a, it's a different thing. Plus, because everybody has gotten so uh, uh, enamored with this quick imagery thing, right? TikTok and this and that, this, you know, and it all started, as you know, you know, we're similar age. Uh, uh, it all started with MTV, the quick cut, you know, da 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 you know, 100 images in a minute or more. That's when it started, and that does something to people's brain. And so I think people are less apt today to go to a museum and really stand in front of a painting and allow that painting to talk to them. And I think they're less apt to do that outdoors as well, you know? But I also find the science of being outdoors now, they call it, I find this very funny. Everybody's reinventing what we've already known. Oh, if you take your shoes off, you connect to the vibration of the earth. Well, no kidding. And they call it, they call it grounding now. Oh, it's yeah. grounding, I'm grounding. I was up in the park one day painting and I see this guy walking in circles with his shoes off and he's talking, you know, like a guru to somebody. And he said, um, you know, I'll call you back. I'm grounding. <laughs> so, oh, wow. Okay. All right. Uh, whatever, so, uh, whatever I, works for you. I'm curious, Joe. Um, I'm sure people watching this who do plein air painting are saying, you know, I, I can stand in front of a painting for two or three hours, which is about the, the amount of light, I assume, you know, a morning, an afternoon or something. Right. Um, and I'll look at that painting, I'll go, I can't even imagine what else I could do to it. So where does that that depth come from? Is That's it That's a great question. Returning it, it, the well, next day with right. the so view? So here's the thing. It, it, every painting is a series of decision making, right? It's, it's there's, uh, and, and, the, with with great artists, it's hierarchical decision making. It's not just when you make the decision, right? I mean, if the house is on fire and you've got a fire extinguisher in your car, you know, and and you you run up ten minutes later and try to put it out, you know, the, you know, good luck. And I think it's one of the things I work very hard with with the students that I teach regularly, uh, like Carl Bretzky and Bob Upton will be there presenting. Uh, um, what I've always done uh, is when people get close on a painting, I will, one of the kind of things that I'll do is I'll, if I have a frame the right size in my studio, I'll pop it in a frame, I'll put it in a good light, I'll get them off to the side of the class and I'll say, get out your notebook. Okay. What you want to do right now, if you have to make 10 moves, think about it like playing chess. You have 10 moves to finish this painting. What are those 10 moves? Once you've made that list, prioritize the list what's most important 
second, third, fourth. And, and it, uh, so I try to get them used to hierarchical decision making. So that answers your question. Because when, when I'm in the forest or pa painting something really complicated, I've got to deconstruct what's in front of me and then visually clarify it, not render it. I don't teach rendering. I don't teach copying. Do I paint what's in front of me? Yes. But it's, it's deconstructed and then put back together in a clarified way where I'm so considering this, flow of light. I'm considering unity within the shadow, unity within the light, um, where I'm grouping my lights, where I'm grouping my dark. So there is a fair amount of subjective decision making involved. So this uh, workshop, pre-convention workshop that you're going to be doing, they're not painting. No. They're, there, no, there's, there's going to be observing. so much. So can you tell us yeah. what kind of what your plan is? Yeah, like I said, I'm going to talk about it. The, the whole point of this is a beautiful beginning, right? My uh, years ago, uh, my mentor said to me, the better the start of your painting is, the, cl the better the start is, the closer it is to being a finish. And, and toward that end, uh, and I trusted him to do this, and I'm glad I did. It changed my life. When I took this year off to study with him when I was 25, I would bring my studies in and I'd say, oh, I want to bring this back out and finish it. He said, I wouldn't. <laughs> and I said, what? I, I love this the idea. I love the start of it. He said, Joe, he goes, what you want to do is take the starts further every time. And there's such a discipline to that. So that I've gotten to a point where I can do a very large painting from life outside and completely hold an effect. Because, because when you, if, if you look at what's out there, it's, if you start well, if you learn to mass, average mass, your, uh, to, do, to, to do a gun underpainting, for example, underpainting to freeze the effect, I'm going to be talking about that. I'm going to be talking about primarily drawing and underpainting and how you set the whole painting up for color and for light. Because I've been working with mentoring students now, uh, my gosh, since 2017, all over the world. And, and what do we talk about at, at the beginning mostly is drawing and underpainting. Because I can take any student, and this is not a, 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 a bragging, this is a fact. This is what's happened with the teaching. Any student that has a good eye and a decent eye for color, and if I can have them backtrack, and work on their drawing and work on their underpainting just with their existing understanding of color without me ever even going further with the prismatic palette with them, uh, I could, they can improve their painting by 50% just like that. But, but I mean, it takes a while to learn how to do these initial stages with love and care and intention. And it takes patience. And a lot of people aren't that patient. Well, think about this, though. If, if, if you could, in a day... Uh, the day, the, the morning the plein air convention starts, really, mm -hmm. which starts in the afternoon. If you could fly in early to the convention, go to this one day and walk away knowing how, maybe you can't do it yet, but knowing how to improve your painting by 50% every time and then going out there the whole week during the convention and practicing that and then practicing it when you get home. Spot on. You wouldn't, but it would make... This is, uh, and I, it's not, honestly, it's not an idle boast. I've been teaching for 26 years. I've taught thousands of people now. And I've trained really a lot of good painters uh, that are doing really well out there. You know, um, it, 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 it's everything. It's not something. And that's why I want to talk about it. Because it, it's not something most people talk about. Because it's not sexy. It's kind of like, you know, all those years, uh, you know, at high school, I played three sports for four years. Never missed a practice. I lifted weights every single day. And, and I was a skinny kid, you know, and I just worked and worked and worked and worked and worked. And it was that, uh, it's the time that nobody notices you that matters. It's the work that you do when nobody's looking that matters. And so the drawing and learning how to do a solid underpainting to freeze an effect of light. And it's not a traditional underpainting uh, like a grisaille. It's not black and white. It's the shadows only. And it's, it's complex and it's sophisticated, but it's super elegant. And if it's done well, you start with beauty. You don't finish with beauty. I mean, you will finish with beauty. But if you could start with beauty instead of having to work towards it, 
If you could make better decisions at the beginning of a painting so you have less mucking around to do later, why wouldn't you want to? You know? I heard a term in Japan. I took a group of 35 people to Japan last week and the week before. And the term is called katawari. Mm. And what the term essentially means is that you're striving for beauty and perfection even when somebody's not watching. Yeah. You know, Steve Jobs used the term. I love it. To say uh, the inside of the MacBook is as beautiful as the outside. We know it's there. We wanted to do it right, even though you'll never see the inside. And it's it's about precision mm. and beauty and making sure everything is done well and done right. Yeah, intentionality, intentionality in every aspect. Yeah. That's what I'm going to be talking about. Beauty and intentionality in it, right from the start of the painting. Are you um, are you going to be you're going to be actually painting? Are you going to show them how you're? Yeah, painting? I'll be doing an underpainting. I'll, uh, you know, I'll be doing an underpainting for sure. But um, like I said, I'm going to talk about drawing in a way that's a little different than a lot the way a lot of people draw because I taught figure drawing for uh, 14 years here in my studio, and the way I draw outside is exactly how I draw a gesture figure. And what, uh, you know, I would, every class we would do 61 minute poses and people would say, well, what can you do in a minute? And I'll tell you, when you establish the hierarchy of a pose, what you can get in a minute or a two minute pose is astounding. If you get to the essence of what you're after and those initial lines relate from, you know, main line of action to the, to the, uh, the line that, that balances it or counters it on the other side of the figure, uh, because drawing all by itself can be static, uh, or it can imply movement. And, and, uh, uh, that's why I want to talk about this because a lot of painting that I look at, uh, feels static. Uh, and, and because you see, uh, and it's a lot of the way people draw uh, is not, it's not bad. It's just kind of cursory. Yeah. They they just get a ba basic thing down so they can get to color, you know. But well, I color, think of, color is sexy. Yeah, color sexy. That's what I'm saying. I, I mean, so I'm talking about the push ups and the sit ups and the jog jogging the track and doing all that stuff that 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 isn't sexy, but that makes that supports all of that stuff in the most beautiful way. It's foundational. Foundational, absolutely, but with elegance and care, and and you know, hopefully, if it goes the way I think it will go, uh, you, when the underpainting is finished, you'll that that'll be beautiful all by itself. I want to show for the people who might be seeing this who don't know. I just want to show them a couple other images. Do you want to tell us about this this particular painting? Yeah, fractured. Uh, it was one of the ones I did during that period. It's a four, uh, forty. Uh, 50 by 40 is what it is. Wow. Uh, and it's, there's, a, there's a stretch along the railroad uh, tracks here that lead to my studio. And there, there are all these old bluffs. And, and uh, I just love the design of it. There's this, the most elegant shape running down the center of it. So when I started with that, and that may be something I show at the uh, convention, the underpainting. I remember taking the underpainting out of the car and my wife, Natalie, coming out of the house going, oh, my God, don't touch it. That's so beautiful all by itself <laughs> because it was uh, there, there's uh, there's uh, shapes and shapes that counter each other, convex against concave. And so it creates this beautiful trip for the eye, exciting trip for the eye. So when you pay attention at, at that level and like I said, you start with something. So there's this beautiful kind of vortex rhythm that runs through that thing, uh, through the trees. If you look, this is like a saw blade effect to the trees. It's convex against concave with angles tucked in there. So it activates the eye, right? And, and, uh, and, and, and that's actually, it was weird because you see bedrock, uh, limestone bedrock at the top, and then it looks like they must have poured concrete down and so uh, being the odd bloke that I am sometimes, I'm like, I want to see if I can pull this off. This is really cool. And so there were uh, all these subtle rhythms. So the idea was to carry your eye from the bottom all the way up into the top and then hopefully delight the eye with the power of the silhouette that was up there. Hmm. And again, that's something I'll be talking about. Um, 
so uh, uh, you know, plus I liked the, the design of it. Okay, this looks like Italy. It is. It is. Yes, that's a big one. That's forty by fifty, um, and uh, I remember doing the underpainting for that, and how, and like I said, how varied the shapes were. The idea, uh, uh, the the one of the prime ideas that I'm going to be going into in great depth at the workshop is the co unity and variety at the same time. And that's what's really challenging for most people uh, because they, uh, they start with a block in, block dash in, and often it looks like that. It's big, chunky shapes, and then they whittle and whittle and whittle and whittle. Now, that's one way to get there, but it takes a lot longer. Uh, I start with really clear shapes. And if you were to blow that up and look at all those tree forms are different. And yet all those shadows are connected. So that, that idea of getting maximum unity and maximum variety at the same time is terribly exciting. It's, it's hard one, it's not easily done. I don't, I'm, I'm not gonna say that, 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 but when you, when you learn to do it, you find beauty everywhere because you notice the little differences within the big similarities and are able to maintain the unity while accessing wild amounts of variety. I just had a flashback when you talked about connecting the darks. And I just realized that yours was the second training I ever took in plein air painting. We were at the uh, old Lime. Uh, oh. The Plein Painters of America had done an event. And the first one I took was Ken Oster. And the second one I took was yours. Mm -hmm. And... I just had I had an epiphany moment, and that is that when you were talking to me about those things then, and I was a brand new baby painter, I couldn't appreciate them or, or, or understand them. And and so it this being able to go back and attend your workshop, which I will be doing, uh, I'm really excited about hearing the principles now that I've been painting for a long time and have an understanding of things because you know, more clarity will be there. So if somebody's yes. been to one of your workshops in the past, you know, a long time ago, maybe it's time to return. Yeah, I just, I can tell you this because I've been teaching for as long as I have. Uh, you know, I, I would, I get, well, uh, you know, with that many students, you kind of get, you know, kind of every personality type and, and, and I would have somebody that would come in and they'd be delightful in the class and they'd take a semester or two and they'd go, I'm just going to go away and practice this. And, and then, you know, they jump around and uh, take a workshop here, a class here, there, 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 there. And I run into them 10 years later and their work hasn't changed at all. Yeah. And, and, and here's the thing. There's nothing wrong with taking different things. I'm all for it. But a linear approach to study. You know, years ago, uh, you know, I've had a lot of professionals take my workshops. You know, uh, Kathleen Dunphy was in my workshop, uh, you know, Kate Starling, John Cosby, uh, Armin Cabrera. And when Cosby was in my workshop, the students, of course, privately were pulling him aside. They said, what are, you, what are you doing here? He said, as an illustrator, I cobbled together an approach to painting outdoors. Joe was taught a, 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 a linear approach to organizing a picture, and I want to I want to learn more about that. And so, you know, for even for people that have painted a long time, I've had mentoring students that have painted for 20 years. They've bought every book. They bought every video. And it's the same thing. There's, no, there's the, uh, the, you know, they're trying this, they're trying that. And, uh, uh, and I'm not about the hook. There's no hook, no gimmick. It's work. It's delightful work. And if you can fall in love with this initial aspect that I'm going to be sharing, It'll, it'll rock your world. It'll completely change your life. And it gives you the opportunity to improve for the rest of your life as well. Well, that's uh, a, that's a care tall to, order. It, yeah. it, well, that's, it's, it's working. All <laughs> I can tell you is I've been doing this a long time and, and I love teaching it, uh, especially when I have, uh, you know, hungry, you know, a hungry student every once in a while, I'll turn away a mentee, somebody, if I think they're not, you know, if somebody's when I kind of interview somebody to, to to mentor, I'm like, well, this might not be for you, you know. And then the other question I invariably ask, and it's a tough question, but it's an important one if I'm to help people, and that's how direct would you like me to be with you? 
uh, uh, and I make sure I put that on the student uh, so that they're responsible for that because um, I'm always kind, but I'm direct because you're there to get better. And if you're there to get better, I, you know, I'm happy to help you. And when somebody's really hungry, you know, I was super hungry when I ran into John Osborne, uh, when I met him after I got out of art school, I was so ripe. Uh, and it was the perfect timing in my life and in his life. Uh, because during that time, I, I took this year off after two years of, you know, painting, uh, one night a week, Thursday night, which is why I, to this day, I have a Thursday night class because I wouldn't be here talking to you if he, he didn't have one. Uh, and then a Sunday morning outdoor. And then two years later, I'm like, I've got to, I'll regret it if I don't do this. So I took a leave of absence from my job at a crappy little apartment, in a bad part of town. And I drew and painted seven days a week. And, um, and I asked him, I said, would you be willing to teach me to mentoring? Wasn't even a word. You know, people weren't using it back then. And he said, yes, I will. And he's never done it. He didn't do it before and he hasn't done it since. It was just perfect timing in both of our lives, no accidents. And, and during that time, he was really um, highly critical with me because he knew I wanted it. And, um, and, and, you know, he, he suggested things to me that he might not have suggested to other people because it was, uh, they wouldn't have been interested. It was, it was too much work. Yeah. Well, you know, he, you, you were w willing to be criticized because he knew you wouldn't be wounded. No, you know, part of it is, you know, having been an athlete and being yelled at constantly, <laughs> and you're, you're never running fast enough. You're never hitting hard enough. You're never, uh, I, I just, you know, I was okay. And, and the, the other part of it is it, it was never a pissing match, Eric. You know, uh, I find uh, with students uh, it, that I say all the time when I teach, start a workshop, I go, guys, look, I'm here to help you. I am not uh, here to impose myself on you. There's a difference. Now, if I say something, I'm going to be very clear. And the two things you never ever have to say in my class are really or do you think? Because frankly, it's all I think about. I'm useless in the real world. I really am. I'm not, I, my brothers can build a house and take an engine apart. And all I think about is drawing and painting. And I love teaching it. I love art history. I love everything about what we do. So I'm super concise when I teach. And, uh, and toward that end, when I critique, people are always amazed. They go, I've never had a teacher get around the group as much as you have in a day. I said, yeah, I get in and I get out. Because teaching, just like painting, at its best to me is hierarchical, right? So the stupid joke I use all the time, but people remember, is it's like artistic triage, right? I come, come up, look at your canvas, I deal with the sucking chest wound first, and then fractures, and then abrasions, and then I move on. <laughs> and, and, and because the, the timing of the critique is as important as the information that I deliver. Right. Because it's all about what you do when. If you want to be able to become more ex ex expedient in, in moving through a painting, that hierarchical decision-making is everything. It's not something. Hey, what I'd like to do is just tell people a little bit about the plein air convention. Sure. You, you have been how many times? One time, two times? Twice. I give the twice. keynote twice there. Yeah. yeah. So you did Las Vegas, I believe, right? Or was it Monterey? I did Monterey mm -hmm. and San Francisco. Okay. Well, yeah. it's time to have you back. Yeah, it'd be good to so, be back. Um, what What is your perception of of what this environment is like, what the convention is like in general? Um, because I can say it all day long. People don't believe me because I'm the one selling it. What, what do you think? Well, I just think it's like a buffet, right? I mean, uh, uh, you go to a buffet and, and uh, not everything is for everyone. And, and, and I think what this offers is a wide array of opportunity to hear people speak or see people demo. People can choose what they want to get out of it, uh, besides being with a group of, uh, of, of kindred spirits. And I think um, there's a certain magic that comes with that. I know that when I teach my workshops, like up on Madeline Island, and everybody's together for a week, and you're, you're on the same campus for a week, and you eat together and you're painting together and uh, if, if, if the energy is the right kind of energy, which of course you know it's really important, um, uh, how, how um, 
like how you start something, how you start the convention, how I start a class sets the tone, you know, for, for the week. So I think, uh, I think people can get as much or as little from an experience like this as, as they choose, you know, and I think it, but the, the fact that it's this broad offering is the big benefit. And uh, the one thing I will, I will tell people is I have, uh, in my experience uh, with you having done this, uh, the couple of times that I've given the authenticity creativity talk, uh, there were a lot of people that came back to me after the fact they couldn't wait to get out painting, so they missed the talk. And then they came back later and said, oh, my God, I, I, I'm so bummed I missed the talk. I was out painting. So, so you know, think about that. Balance, I, I would be mindful uh, as, a, as, a, as an attendee about paying attention to what the offerings are uh, because painting is great, but you can always paint. Uh, you can't always have access to these artists. Well, you know, one of the things that we suffer with is that we spend a year, two years planning this event. Um, we put people on stages and sometimes people don't know who they are. And so they automatically assume they shouldn't see them. And, we, you know, we put them on those stages for very specific reasons, uh, including this year. We have some very unique things that we're doing this year that have very specific purpose that we want people find. And that's why we need them to trust us, follow the agenda. We have five stages. I'll show everybody a couple of pictures. We have, um, we have pre-convention workshops um, where people in this particular one, it's a watercolor they're painting. Yours is not going to be painting, but demonstrating in these workshops, we have um, a big stage. This is probably what your workshop will look like. There's a, there's also a big screen so you can see, but we have a, um, an opportunity to really learn well. And then we have a big stage, which has uh, really big screens. And, and uh, that's the one where when we all get together or the, the demos that have the most attention, but there are five stages. <clears throat> and then um, the convention is coming up on May 20th through 24th. <clears throat> it's the first one a lot of people have been able to drive to because it's in the Smoky Mountains, uh, Smoky Mountain National Park right outside of it in Cherokee, which is near Asheville. And um, there are only 40 seats left to the convention. There are plenty of seats left to Joe Paquette's workshop. Uh, that's not yet sold out, but um, the workshop is designed for people who are attending the convention. Although if you can't attend the convention, you really want to come to the, con to the workshop PM me and I'll see if we can work something out. But we typically can't do that. But um, go to plenairconvention.com, get registered, and then go in there and register for Joe Paquette's pre-convention workshop. Uh, we also have some other pre-convention workshops. Joe, I would be remiss if I didn't mention them. Uh, we have Amit Kapoor, the great watercolor artist from India, is coming in and, and doing our first pre-convention workshop in watercolor. We also have Aaron Schur doing a pre-convention workshop in pastel. And we have what we call the basics course. And uh, we highly recommend if you're brand new to this and you don't know about using easels and painting outdoors and you don't even know if you want to paint in oil or watercolor or other things, go to the basics course. Uh, when we go painting every day, which we all do as a group, um, the basics course people will be there with you. You'll be painting together if you if you choose to. We also have what we call field painters. We have about 80 instructors who go out there, and when you're out there painting, no matter what course you've attended, and, and we all paint together, as I mentioned, they're there. They're running around with a hat and a, and a flag so they can get noticed, and they're there to coach you, to give you some ideas, to help you. Because the whole idea here is about learning, uh, learning and, and growing and getting what you can. So we would like to invite you to the plein air convention. Uh, as I mentioned, there's only about 40 seats left. Uh, this is, turns out, going to be the biggest one we've ever done. Um, but don't, don't let that worry you because the size, it won't, it'll still feel intimate because you have the ability to go out to five different stages. There's a big expo hall. There's lots of parties, lots of events, uh, lots of painting together. Um, and we have, you don't need a car. We have buses you can sign up for. 
uh, that take you to the locations. As a matter of fact, the National Park is recommending you take the buses because parking is a problem in the National Park. And so you don't need to get a rental car. You just have to get to the location. Uh, Joe's workshop starts the day the convention starts. So it's on the 20th. The convention starts late in the afternoon on the 20th. So his starts the morning of the 20th, as do all the other workshops. Early, very early. Very early. <laughs> Hopefully yeah, there'll you. be coffee there, Eric. <laughs> yeah, we'll have coffee. And you'll want to get in there the night before. <clears throat> so, Joe, uh, anyway, any final final thoughts on this? No, I'm just really excited about uh, talking about this aspect of the painting that I'm terribly passionate about. And I think it'll benefit everybody. So I'm, I'm excited to do it. I'm excited too. And I, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm not supposed to play favorites, but you are my favorite. So well, I, I well am done. going to attend your <laughs> workshop and uh, I'm, I'm really excited about it. And uh, of course, uh, anybody who gets a chance to do uh, mentoring with Joe or studying with Joe or going to his workshops anywhere they're held, where you can get five days in a row. And, and not all of the workshops are the same topic, right? So this one at our convention is no, about- No, yeah, I just two weeks beginnings. before, yeah. Literally two weeks before that in my studio, I'm teaching a composition and design workshop. It's a studio-based, five-day, exercise-based, uh, really cool class I put together 25 years ago when I first came to Minnesota that I used to teach it as a regular semester class, but it's all, you know, kind of compressed into five days. Awesome, yeah. terrific. Well, uh, Joe, what's your website, just so people know? Uh, 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 www.joepaquette.com. Joepaquette.com. I'm right. also Joe. on Instagram, Facebook. So. <laughs> okay. Well, Joe, thank you so much for uh, explaining these things today. I think we all learned a little bit of something. And um, No, thanks for helping me uh, flesh it out a little bit and uh, the, for the good questions that help uh, people get a better understanding of what the offering is. Absolutely. Yeah. All right. Well, Joe, thanks again and have a great day. You too. Thanks, Eric. All right. Our guest today has been Joe Paquette and uh, he's going to be at the Plin Air Convention this year uh, on stage, but also there's an optional pre-convention workshop you can attend with Joe. And that, as I explained, there are others. I'm Eric Rhodes, publisher of Plin Air Magazine. Thank you for watching today. Bye-bye.